started Open to Society back in 2009, we really seen a website and a web presence, an internet presence, as basically being the mainstay of almost what we would be. That had come out as an understanding that between 1821, 1831 and 1871, the population of our 62 townlands in South Tyrone dropped by nearly 40%. And it has never really recovered. It's, it's a byword for most of us here in, in Ireland, in fact. And I don't think it ever will recover, certainly not with an even another night thing. Um, so, if you like, our audience is out there. We, we need local people to feel that direct enthusiasm and, and basically be a core. But you'll find, if you're going around this route, very often your membership could be two-thirds of the people who might not even get to visit at these shores but they will have a family connection. So, uh, I had a bit of web design experience, not a great deal, and certainly not an expert on it, um, but it developed over time as, as our presence, literally say who we are, what we are, where we are, but also then we want to use it as a resource, as somewhere to go, or specifically for information about our local area, and we develop that information to go on the website. For members outside of the shores, we wanted a way to facilitate the payment of membership fees, which would be online, because so much is done that way nowadays. Um, and, and really just this was a number of aspects that all had to go on this website. Now it was all done in house, it was covered with some grant money, but to do something commercially out there with a web design company. Right now, on a similar scale, you probably need as much change out of 5,000 pounds. But I mean, that's 10 years of development has gone into that to put it on that sort of scale. But I had to hope to sort of use the internet to sort of demonstrate the website online, but the Wi Fi connection is a bit difficult at this distance, so I've put out sort of stills of the web page to sort of demonstrate. So just go to the first slide here. So this is what our website looks like when you visit it. This is the front page. So, Collation Club needs to start its study. But obviously, we have received funding and continue to receive funding from the likes of the European Union, Peace Forward Fund, etc., and the Mid Ulster Council, who, and we're in their area. So, those locals are front and centre as required <coughs> under their um, rules that you know, if you receive funding. The other thing we have down here in the bottom of the website is a link to our Charities Commission number. When you click on that link, it takes you to the page of the Charities Commission website where all our accounts are there and our rules and regulations. So again, that's all part of it. The other thing we have, unfortunately, to read all these new guidelines, it's up here is a privacy button, and that's the privacy policy under the dreaded GDPR. If you've heard everybody talk about this in the last year, the General Data Protection Regulations. So there's a privacy uh, statement in there as well. So I wanted to have a front page that had sort of relevant information, fairly quickly accessible, but not too clever. Uh, so we have a menu along the top, menu down the side, we have a login area here, because our members get a login username and password, and that gives them access to parts of the website that the public cannot get. And that's again a justification for the fee. Over here in the bottom right, we have a calendar, and for those uh, days uh, where you see it, the, the date highlighted, then there'll be an event that you can click on and see where that is. And I have started actually put in the events of other historical societies in the Toronto and even our Armagh area on top of ours, because I sort of thought we needed some sort of a central resource that everybody could remember to go to and see everything, because by a rather amazing trick of fate. Most of the societies in Germany have managed to pick different nights for their talks. And I, I'd love to say that was by design, but it probably wasn't. But thanks to goodness it didn't happen that way. And um, we have a link to our Facebook page, which which we have, but it's not the mainstay of what we are. And it, the problem is that needs someone else then. And the girl that have been looking at that uh, has changed jobs in recent years. And it's, it's harder to keep two things on the go at the same time. But for many of you, Facebook would probably be at least a starting point. We'll come to that later. 
And uh, this area here allows people to pay their membership subscriptions online via PayPal. Now, when they put in the amount, which for us is 20 pounds a year or 30 pounds per couple, and click pay, they leave our website and they go to PayPal. So the security is involved with giving credit card information, and all of that is all organised through PayPal. It's not on our website. This is just purely a link to initiate the website. So I'll just move on to the next page. Yeah. How much do PayPal charge you, or do they charge the person? Well, the, the standard rate that everybody gets, whatever it is, two, three percent or whatever. But um, I mean, we we took a decision earlier on that you know, look, it's going to cost something anyway. If we could get in, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds of membership from overseas that we couldn't possibly get otherwise. Three percent. Yeah, we can live with it, and um, it actually has surprised us how much we've lived with it. So. I wanted to talk about statistics because the first thing you should have said, right, there's a lot of personal time and energy and all these other things and money that's gone in to generate a website. Is there anything we can lean on to say this has been worth our way? <laughs> well, hopefully very obvious things like your membership increases, you're getting contact from people abroad or even in the locality you're using the website. Well, that's obviously a very obvious way of finding out what's going on, but we can use statistics. And this is the current statistics for our website. And the important figure here um, is the number of visits. And for the last calendar year, from April 2018, the number of visits to our website is just under 77,000. Now, a lot of that can literally be told. I think there's no real easy way to quantify that in terms of the length of time. You obviously have members who are regularly in and out of the website, but that is as good a figure as we can come up with with the amount of attention the website gets. We'll go into a wee bit more detail, something a bit more quantifiable and like as we go along. Now, one of the most important parts of our website that we created was an archive, an online archive. Some of this is open to the public, some of it the member must log in to actually be able to access it. And in terms of access, they can download it to their computer. And this would probably be in a PDF format, something easily readable without specialised software. And we have it sort of broken up into categories. The most popular would tend to be church records, uh, which we spent quite a bit of time in our first year going around the various churches and getting permissions to record those, whatever. Now, there has been legislation quoted from um, by the representative church body in the last, it's probably for quite a number of years, which hasn't all really filtered around to everybody, whereby effectively Church of Ireland records cannot be copied at all under any circumstances. Um, and certainly not then made publicly. So there probably would need to be something to tidy up this. Part of that legislation goes back literally to disestablishment or something crazy like that, and then there might have been a fresher piece of legislation. But it is providing a massive roadblock in terms of what local societies can do. My main concern over that legislation, and it does exist, nobody's making it up. I've seen the, the bulletin that went out from the representative church body for all the different Church of Ireland, uh, parishes, etc., is that. I have heard a rumour that Crony were going to seek to re-digitise existing church records mm. still being held in churches around the country. <coughs> I know from personal experience, and I'm sure many of you here would have gone and seen your own local records, that project in some respects is doomed because most of them will have deteriorated further from the original captures that were done decades ago. Um, a lot of them sit in cast iron safes with no um, protection from the damp, and many of them will have some sort of fungal rot, and the ink is degrading, and they're just basically becoming legible. So, we certainly felt we needed to get out there and photograph them. And by photographing them, it allowed us to digitally enhance those that were badly faded. But I think that's a massive conversation that needs to be had nationally before it's too late. Um, because if we're waiting for Crony to do it, that's going to take a massive amount of money and organisation. And by the time those things happen in our current environment, I think it will be too late. It probably is too late for some record. But we, we have it done. 
But you are limited as to what we can do by that legislation. But anyway, there are other ones there that are not limited, and we have those available for our members to download. The other thing we did was we started to create databases of information taken from online sources, transcribed, but built up just specifically our area of 62 townlands. And this included things like even um, army service records for palatial, dog war, etc. from these areas. The flat growers list, Bill McAfee's wonderful work on the hard money rolls that's been online for years. But again, taking that down to our local area. So here again, the members can click on this link and they can log in to the database section of our website and access some of these. So British Army Service Records, 1760 to 1915. Flag Tours List, Freeholders List, Hearth Money Rolls, Religious Census, Royal Commission, the Irish Commission 1622, the Time Blotting Books, and there's quite a lot of people who use this, but it's specific to our area, which is what makes it very, very uh, useful. Uh, this is another example, this is an interrogation of Hearth Money Rolls, and again, credit to Bill McAfee for, for putting effectively spreadsheets and PDFs available on his website years ago. Um, but again, we're just taking Tyrone here for our own area. Now, I mentioned about events in the little calendar here on the front page and it's here on, on this other page. This is, uh, an, it's effectively our events diary. So whoever's managing the website can go in the back end, set up an event, schedule the time, say where it is, say what's about, maybe post a picture or two, and then this become an events calendar in its own right. Um, so this is, for instance, there's a talk in Dunford Historical Society coming up, I think possibly, not next week, but the weekend after, on the history of Castle Haunting. Um, I'm doing a talk at Ben Bird uh, on the 9th of April, the 9th of Reverend John Kennedy. Um, there's other ones there, Power Street Story, I think, is, and Stewart's Town, that's possibly the thing to do. So I put in other people's events, not just their own, uh, because it's nice to just have a central point to go and uh, find that information out. Now videos. Um, we have videoed many of our talks over the years, and we upload those and host them on a video account. Video would be similar to YouTube. And in fact, these are the videos that we've posted since we started as a society. Um, the total viewing for all of those videos since 2009 is 28,500. It's really quite remarkable the amount of things that are looked at over the internet with regard to what you do. You might think they're very specifically local and maybe not a great way to pay, but over time it all adds up. The, the most heavily viewed video, I think, in that was a talk that came here did at Carter I think that was probably 2010 or 11 on townland naming. And obviously part of the project that she was involved with, which still has an active website, thank heavens. 4,000 views since that went up. So, you know, it's a great, a great place to get, record your videos, upload them to YouTube or whatever, and again provide them so that people can, can go and watch them. Stories and poems, we, we had a few local people, they're not well-known authors or well-known poets, there were local people who had a gift for poetry, and uh, these were three or four that um, we uploaded and put on the website, and the one that has done the best of all by Michael McCusker was a story of Baden Hay from someone who lived there, and it's full of characters, you know, reminiscences, like 3,200 viewings from our downloads, from that was put on our website. And that's open to the public, that we, we treat that as public to be information <coughs> specifically for members. We have a news section, so anything that you know stands out what we've done with a visit to the Heaney Home Place there a while back. And then uh, this latest one I posted was we did a talk on the Holland family of Tyrone on Tuesday night past. And we had 90 turn up at that. We literally had nowhere else to stand or sit. Literally, uh, we were in the we both were in the doorway. Well, we took a real stand and decided to broadcast that live on YouTube at the same time. 
who did in the last three to four days, it has been viewed over 300 times. And we know it's been viewed in Spain, Australia, America, uh, New Zealand, all over parts of England, just basically everywhere, um, through not only connections to the Holland family, but members of ours who have never been able to do this before. But they watched it live. And the way we did it was we broadcast the screenshots of the PowerPoint alongside audio in the microphone. So it was nearly as good as being there, although we couldn't get the atmosphere going. But, I mean, everybody, with lots of really good positive feedback from the background. And that actually is a clip of the YouTube page where the video is. And if you look down here, 302 views. So, uh, about an hour and a half long. But lots of good slides, you know, relevant to the Holland family, the background of the name of Hilloy and all that, and, and went down really well. <laughs> we actually had a private donation set in post. I'm not going to embarrass the individual by saying how much it was, but it was very, very substantial. So it, it, it had a massive knock on effect on a lot of people. So really, really good. Idea. So, um, now, regarding information about our local areas, I've talked about the database and church records and things. The left-hand side would be land-related or other things that we sort of put together. So, places of worship is a big thing in Ireland. It's, it's very much part of our culture and our heritage. So, in our 62 townlands, we would really have, I don't know, a dozen plus churches or altar plants or whatever. So, there's a wee link on the left, places of worship. It's just a picture of the, the place of worship and a short paragraph and a little link to it. <coughs> so, I would say most of the could probably facilitate something similar. Um, land ownership was a big thing because a lot of people would ask me, how has the land changed hands from pre-plantation through to today? The they get found out about plantation. They get found out about land grants. They know about the Griffiths valuation, but they were trying to see how it has it evolved. Who actually did have the land here before the plantation? So I developed these sort of colour coded maps, um, really just explaining that this evolution over time. And they they proved very, very uh, good with people trying to sort of get a feel for how history has evolved in terms of the land. These are a couple of other maps. Now, this, this top one here is an extract from the Bodley map. And what I did there was I extracted from the Bodley map our 62 townlands. And what was fascinating about that was when we compared, when we took the Bodley map extract and turned it up with the correct north, south, east, west orientation, was how closely it resembled the modern map. And in fact, I know that there's been computer analysis done in the Bodley maps that suggested accuracy levels of up to 87%, which is staggering for something that was done 410 years ago. And most of it by word of mouth. And rather than, than the satellite navigation or whatever. Uh, and this is another one where effectively it created a map of the Valley Vetus onto the modern mapping landscape and colour coded those for our world <coughs> and South Road, etc. Now, the other thing is, for, for nearly all of us in Ireland, townlands are the backbone of who we are. Um, and ours is based around this sort of catchment of roughly 62. So what I did here was I created a map, uh, which you can click on to expand it out larger, of our 62 townlands. But I've used 10 years, King's website, facenamesni.org, uh, to provide a table where they click on the relevant townland name, you go to their website and get whatever information the Game Years team has put together over the years with regard to it. So you're using your website as a, as a, as a meeting, as a focus point, but you are linking into external information elsewhere that there's no point in trying to recreate this. It's a waste of time. Also, it really doesn't serve any purpose to do it that way either. So linking through is really, really good. Oh, I think that's all. So, um, that's basically a quick run through our website and where we are. So, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to those. Could take questions. I have questions to take. Back after the session. No problem. Yeah. Thank you very much.